Okay, brethren, we're still in the book of Amos, the minor prophet of Amos. And uh, you remember uh, the structure of the book, hopefully. <laughs> the first couple of chapters of Amos were about uh, eight prophecies relating to Israel and to some surrounding nations. That was the first eight uh, prophecies. Then the second division of the book is entitled uh, Th Three Sermons that, uh, that Amos has to give because he's been sent by God from, from Judah up north to, to Bethel, to Israel, to preach to them and warn them of God's coming judgment. So he mentions these eight prophecies about Syria and uh, Philistia and so on and Israel, but the people don't believe him. They don't believe God could judge them because in their delusion, they seem to think, well, how, how could that be? You know, we're, we're God's people. You know, we are descendants of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. This land we're living in here is the land of promise, which Jehovah God promised to us. You know, King David used to rule over this area. Well, we're God's people. None of this stuff can happen, Amos. So Amos gives then three sermons to try and persuade them or convince them that, no, no, uh, this judgment is coming, right? You need to pay attention. And uh, we've been through sermon number one, uh, sermon number two. Last week we started sermon number three, which is where we'll pick up today, right? So if we open our Bibles at Amos chapter five, let's just quickly recap the first part of the third sermon. The third sermon, sermon number three, goes across Amos chapter five and chapter six. Two chapters, quite a long sermon. And last week we did chapter five, so we move on to chapter six in a moment. But first, just a quick recap of the first part of this sermon. So chapter 5, verses 1 and 2. Hear this word which I take up against you, a lamentation, O house of Israel. The virgin of Israel has fallen. She will rise no more. She lies forsaken on her land. There is no one to raise her up. And verse 1 says a lamentation. Other translations bring out uh, a dirge. Uh, a funeral message, a lamentation. So what Amos is doing is he's giving them uh, a funeral story, their funeral, because verse 2 says the virgin of Israel is fallen, gone, will never rise again, which turns out to be true apart from in the millennium, but not till then. Okay, dropping down to verses uh, 4 and 6. For thus says the Lord to the house of Israel, seek me and live. So even at this stage, there is at least a God's hand is out saying, seek me, come to me and, and live. Verse 6, seek the Lord and live. It's very late in the day to do that and to repent, but you know, God's mercy is fresh every day. So if they could find their way to, to repent, there's still that chance. But we know they didn't do that, of course. Look at verses 18 to 20. Woe to you who desire the day of the Lord. It looks like it might be ironic. <laughs> They're sort of scoffing at Amos. Where is this day of the Lord you keep talking about, Mr. Prophet? Get on with it. Laugh, laugh, laugh. Chuckle, chuckle, chuckle. Woe to you who desire the day of the Lord. For what good is the day of the Lord to you? It will be darkness. Just remind me, this is going to be a bad time. Darkness, not light. It will be as though a man fled from a lion, thinks at last I've escaped, and run round the corner and have escaped the lion, and he runs straight into a bear, which knocks his head off. No escape. Or as though he went into a house, right? Turns around, slams the door shut, bolts it shut, locks it. He's now safe. He's in the house. Can't be got at. Leans his hand on the wall, and a serpent bites him. <laughs> so there's no escape. When God's judgment comes, doesn't matter where you are or where you run, uh, your time is up. Right? God's going to get you wherever you are. Uh, verse 20, is not the day of the Lord, which Amos is trying to present to them, darkness and not light, is it not very dark with no brightness in it? You don't want the day of the Lord to come, guys. Seek the Lord and live. But they didn't. So their day of the Lord arrived in due course. When the nation was taken 
in captivity. Many were killed, of course. The rest were taken in captivity to Assyria. Look at verse 27, which is the final wrap-up of this part of the uh, third sermon. Therefore, says God, I will send you into captivity beyond Damascus, says the Lord, whose name is the God of hosts, the God of armies. So Amos is trying his hard to say, look, this is going to happen. You are going to go into captivity. Now, many will be killed, of course, before then. Many will starve in the siege, be killed by the sword. Those that survive, at least alive, will be taken off to captivity. In many cases with hooks through their mouths, taken off through the broken walls into captivity, which we know uh, latterly was to Assyria, 722 BC, about 30 years after Amos is giving them this, this, if you like, final warning message. So that's that. Let's continue with chapter 6 now. So it's still the third sermon. just happens to spread over two chapters. Uh, chapter 6, verse 1. Woe to you who are at ease in Zion and trust in Mount Samaria, notable persons in the chief nation to whom the house of Israel comes. Well, woe is, of course, I think we know, uh, a curse. It's not just a passing reference. It means woe, cursed to those who are at ease. Some translations say complacent. I mean, there's nothing wrong with being at ease. I quite enjoy a bit of ease now and then, if I can, right? But at ease here means that you should be, you should be looking at the terrible things happening. You should be pondering, you know, your walk with God. You shouldn't be neglectful, uh, lazy, enjoying luxury at a time of crisis, which is what they were doing. Woe to you who are at ease in Zion, which of course is Jerusalem and Judah, and those who trust in Mount Samaria, that would be Israel, trusting in their capital city. It's, uh, it's, it's um, they thought, perhaps impregnable. They've got a mighty army based at Samaria. They've got king, in this case, King Jeroboam II, right? They should be trusting in God. They should be dealing with the issues around them, you know, the, the crime, uh, the bribery, the injustice. Verse 2, go over to Calne and see, and from there go to Hamath the Great, then go down to Gath of the Philistines. Are you better than these kingdoms, or is your territory uh, greater, or is their territory greater than yours? So it looks like there's three cities mentioned here. I don't know much about them, Calne, Hamath, uh, and Gath. But I believe all those three cities were quite, quite important cities in the day, had been subjugated, taken over you know, under other rule. And what it seems to be the case is Amos is saying on God's behalf, look, look at these big cities, these important cities. They've been subjugated. Do you think you're any better? Right? Do you think you're more important than these cities? They've already fallen. Right? You're no better. So don't be, don't be, uh, don't be arrogant. Don't be somehow proud, so proud of yourselves that you think this can't happen to you. It can. And Amos says, it will happen to you. Verses 3 to 7. Woe to you who put far off the day of doom, who caused the seat of violence to come near. So you're ignoring the reality of God's coming judgment, but you're immersed here and now in violence. Those, verse 4, who lie on beds of ivory, stretch out on your couches, eat lambs from the flock and calves from the midst of the stall. These people, at least the uh, ruling class, were living in, in, in near luxury. You know, beds of ivory or perhaps decorated with, with ivory inlay and so on, eating lambs and calves or the finest food, stretching out on their, <laughs> their lounges and their couches who sing idly to the sound of stringed instruments and invent for yourselves musical instruments like David, who drink wine from bowls, anoint yourselves with their best ointments and perfumes and creams, but you're living in luxury. You know, bowls of, of wine, the very finest meals, yet, right, you are not grieved for the affliction of Joseph, meaning the, the land of Israel. That's what they should be. Well, God would rather they were sighing and crying for the abominations in their country, seeking some way to deal with them, seeking repentance and, and, and God's blessing. But instead of that, they're enjoying the good life. 
while all around them is bribery, exploitation, injustice. Verse 7, Therefore they shall now go captive as the first of the captives, and those who recline at banquets shall be removed. So if you look at uh, verse 1, these people see themselves as notable persons, famous persons, right? They want to be first in society, <laughs> looked up to you know, by, by the peasants because they're so important and famous celebrities. God says, verse 7 there, actually, you want to be first in the land? You'll be first into captivity. Therefore, they shall now go captive as the first of the captives. They'll be the first to go. I think that in reality would often happen. When an invading nation would come in, they'd, they'd try to find the educated, the wealthy, uh, the, um, the courier, the courtiers, the royal family, get them first, drag them off into captivity. They'll be the first to go. Verse, verse 8. The Lord God has sworn by himself. The Lord God of hosts says, I abhor the pride of Jacob, hate his palaces. Therefore, I will deliver up the city and all that is in it is going to happen. Now, if God says something, if God says I'm going to bring judgment on this nation, destroy it, take you captive far away, well, God will do that. Right? God, God's word is good. Right? God cannot lie. So it says, verse 8, God has sworn by himself. Can't swear by much else, can he? God swears by himself or by his own holiness, I will do this. That's, that's, a, that's a vow. If Almighty God says he'll do something, he'll do it. Right? If he vows and takes an oath to do something, you rest assured that's, it's a done deed. And he says he's going to do it. God has sworn by his own self. I abhor the pride of Jacob or Israel. Therefore, I will deliver up the city and all that's in it. It will happen because God hates pride. You know? uh, God resists the proud, says elsewhere, gives grace to the humble. If these people would humble themselves and seek the Lord, it would be very different. But God resists pride. I think it says in Proverbs, pride goes before that's destruction, true. right? And the haughty spirit before a fall. So at this stage of the game, it looks like it was a sort of golden age for the land of Israel. Jeroboam II, who was the king at this time, uh, reigned for over 40 years, which is, I think, 41 years. That's the longest period of rule in Israel's history. So it was a time of considerable stability. And Jeroboam was not, not very good from God's perspective. He was an OK uh, ruler in, in civilian terms. So the land had peace, relative peace with nearby nations. It prospered. It was a golden age. People lived comfortably, as you can see here, on ivory beds, couches, at least the, the, the wealthy ones, uh, the rulers, the, the elite. No doubt at the bottom, life was pretty grim, right? Uh, especially since uh, justice was difficult to obtain. Too much bribery, too much people at the top scratching each other's backs and so on. But God says here, he swears, you're going into captivity. End of story. Let's move on to verses uh, 9 and uh, 10. <clears throat> uh, verses 9 and 10, a uh, little bit difficult to translate, it seems, so somewhat, somewhat obscure, but we'll do our best to get some sort of handle on them. Verses 9 through 10, Then it shall come to pass that if ten men remain in one house, they shall die. Remember the previous verse says God will definitely deliver up the city and everybody in it to destruction. He swore it's going to happen. So part of that is verse 9. It shall come to pass at that time when God delivers up the city that if ten men remain in one house, they shall die. Nobody escapes. Pretty much. And when a relative of the dead, with one who will burn the bodies, picks up the bodies to take them out of the house, he will say to one inside the house, Are there any more with you? So I think some translations say an uncle, a relative who turns up, obviously, after the event has happened. And somebody suggested that, well, once the Assyrians arrived in the land and, and, and people died and many were taken away captive, there might be some extended families a few miles south in Judah. Quite easy to understand. 
today many people live 20 miles, 30 miles, 50 miles apart from their families. That could be the case then. Anyway, a relative turns up to do the decent thing with the, uh, the dead bodies and then he gets to the, the house in question and says, are there any more with you? Then someone will say, none, everybody's dead. And he will say, hold your tongue, for we dare not mention the name of the Lord. So what you can take away from that is 10 in the house, they're all dead. And yet somebody must be remaining alive because when the person, the uncle, the relative comes and says, Any, anybody else in there uh, apart from these ones here? And the voice answers, nope, nobody else here, just us. And if they all die, I guess that person must be perhaps about to die. And then the, the latter part of verse um, 10 says, He will say, hold your tongue, for we dare not mention the name of the Lord. That's obscure. But the uh, best guesses are, if God has cursed the land, and that's why people are dead, and here all ten in the house are dead, that could be starvation in a siege of the city. It could be disease or plague that often follows on war. If it's an end time application you're looking for, this could be biological warfare, as a result of all ten being dead, or perhaps radiation, right? So there are all dead, or one has got enough breath to shout out, nobody else, just just us. And the guy says, don't mention God's name. Now, it's thought there's po probably a superstitious element to this, that what people thought in those days was, if God's cursing you, a nation, a city, a house, right, but you somehow, somehow survive a bit longer, <laughs> you don't want to use God's name in case it draws his attention to you. <laughs> Because you know that God's cursed you, I'm still alive, right? So thank God, um, don't use God's name, because God may have missed you. <laughs> and if you shout out God's name, you know, hang on, did somebody shout my name in that? Well, I thought they were all dead. Oh, you should be dead. Boom, dead you are. So that might be the meaning of that. Ultimately, the key uh, takeaway is they're all dead, right? <laughs> Which is what God said he's going to do. He's going to deliver everybody from the city, either dead or into captivity. These ones here appear to be dead in, in a house. Disease, possibly. Let's move on and read verses um, 11 to 13. For behold, the Lord gives a command. He will break the great house into bits and the little house into pieces. Going to fragment and shatter Everything, every building, every home, right? Uh, every residence is going to be crushed, sm smashed to smithereens. That's what God's going to do. He's going to bring judgment. And of course, remember, the point of Amos here is he's giving his third sermon, just trying to convince these people that pay attention. You know, what's coming is going to be terrible. This day of the Lord, as he intervenes in your nation, Israel, Samaria, right? He's going to destroy everything. Doesn't matter where you run, into the house, away from the line, you'll meet a bear, you'll get bitten by a serpent, right? You're going to go into captivity. Seek the Lord and live, but if not, mm, it's, it's doom and gloom, right? Um, verse 12 and 13. Do horses run on rocks? Well, not very effectively. Does one plow there with oxen? Mm, that's not going to work, is it? Yet you have turned a justice into gall or poison. You've turned the fruit of righteousness into wormwood or bitterness, right? Uh, and so do you, do you run horses over rocks? No, that'd be absolutely absurd. That's, that's stupid to do that. Only a moron would try to race a horse over rocky ground. Do you plow on the rocks with oxen? That's ridiculous, absurd, stupid. And yet, equally absurd, equally stupid, Israel, is your turning justice, which God loves, into poison or gall? You've turned righteousness, which God loves, into wormwood or bitterness. That's as absurd as trying to run your horse over rocks. It makes no sense. Verse 13. You who rejoice over Lodibar, who say, Have we not taken Karnaim for ourselves by our own strength? Again, slightly obscure in the sense of the translators aren't too sure whether 
These are two places, one called Lodi Bar, one called Karnaim. There certainly were towns or villages with those names. Some translators just translate the Hebrew into another word. You who rejoice over nothing or not. That's what some translations say because the word Lodi Bar or the words Lodi Bar is a, a small insignificant town right? It's, it has no particular importance. It's essentially nothing. <laughs> and that's what it means. So you could translate Lodi Bar as nothing town. So you who rejoice over capturing nothing town, or the pure Hebrew, you who rejoice over nothing, who say, have we not taken Karnaim for ourselves? Karnaim can be translated horns, and horns in Scripture, Old Testament, can mean power, like the horns of an ox means power or strength. So they say they seem to be rejoicing or boasting Israel. Well, we captured Lodibar, meaning nothing, nothing town. We've captured Karnaim, strength, by our own fantastic strength. They're boasting, they're arrogant, they're filled with pride over essentially nothing. And uh, Amos continues, well, you want to talk about strength? You want to talk about the strength that you demonstrated when you captured horns or the city of horns or Karnaim? You want to talk about your strength when you did that, when you captured nothing town? I'll tell you what, guys. I will raise up a nation against you, O house of Israel, says the Lord God of hosts, and they will afflict you from the entrance of Hamath to the valley of the Araba. This, you want to see strength? and ability to capture cities, oh, you'll see it all right. You're going to be at the receiving end because God says, I'm bringing a mighty, strong, powerful nation against you and they'll capture all of you from uh, Hamath up in the north of the country all the way down to the Arabah in the south of the country. It's coming, all right? So no point boasting about your feeble winds when you capture Lodi Blar or nothing town, right? You're going to meet a mighty nation it's going to besiege you, it's going to kill many of you, it's going to take the rest away to captivity, from which it would seem Israel never returned. Right? So that's his third sermon. <clears throat> and of course, uh, Assyria, as I said earlier, arrived in about 722 BC. I think it took several years to besiege the capital city of Samaria and finally overcome it. But after, I think, three years or thereabouts, uh, the Assyrians had won the battles. They killed lots of people. The rest they took captive uh, and destroyed much of the land and then brought others in sort of later on. So that's the three sermons. So you've got the eight prophecies, chapters 1 and 2. You've got the three sermons as Amos works hard to convince them, this is going to happen, guys. You know, stop stop ignoring this. This is, this is real. God has sworn he's going to do this. So you're paying any attention. And after that, uh, Amos now moves into Div Division 3, as it, as it can be constructed, which are five visions. He's going to have five visions, a vision of locusts, a vision of fire, a vision of a plumb line, brackets possibly, close brackets, a vision of summer fruit, and a vision of uh, stricken doorposts. A bit odd that one, right? So five visions. So we'll get through... Uh, we'll probably <laughs> we'll get through more than one. We'll get through Two. probably four-ish, give or take a bit. And these visions go up to the up to the last five verses of the book. So when you've got the five visions, that's pretty much complete. Then there are five promises on the last five verses at the very end of Amos chapter nine. So we're getting there. Next week we should complete. <clears throat> <laughs> it's my intention anyway. So, chapter 7, uh, the first vision. Thus the Lord God showed me. So he, he, he saw something. It's a, a vision. Behold, he, God, formed locust swarms at the beginning of the late crop. Indeed, it was the late crop after the king's mowings. And so it was when they had finished, the locusts had finished eating the grass of the land, that I said, O oh Lord God, forgive, I pray, 
Oh, that Jacob, the nation, may stand, for he is small. So the Lord relented concerning this. It shall not be, said the Lord. So there's only three verses, but there's a reasonable amount so in there to look at. So there's this vision of locusts. We wonder what locusts do. We read the book of Joel some months ago. Locusts arrive, they devour all the, the greenery, and then <laughs> you're sunk as a nation because you need, you need the, the, the grain, the grasses for, for food so that your livestock can, can live off the food. Without that, you're going to go hungry, possibly starve. Um, and, of course, you might be impoverished because lots of it was an agricultural agrarian society. If there's no, no grain and the cattle are dying and there's nothing to eat, uh, you become very impoverished, right? It's a bad time. And it says here that God forms the locust swarms at a particular time. It says at the beginning of the late crop, indeed it was the late crop after the king's mowings. And what that suggests is that when it comes harvest time, the king and the royal palaces get first, right? So you have to take your first harvest and give it to the king. It's the king's mowings. It's like a tax. Obviously, the king's an important person, right? And he's got a big family and friends and important dignitaries. So first time round, you go out there and you do the first harvest, bring it in, it goes to the king. What's left? is for the people. And unfortunately, that's when the locusts were due to arrive. <laughs> so the poor people basically get shafted. They get nothing. The king gets the first lot, and the locusts get the second lot. <laughs> oh, my word, that's pretty grim, isn't it? Which is grim. And to be fair to Amos, he says, oh, oh hang on a second, God. Um, oh, please, you know, at verse 2, please forgive. Jacob is so small and insignificant in the big scheme of things. Please forgive. And God says, uh, okay. Verse 3, the Lord relented. It's not going to happen, says the Lord. So that's quite something. Amos intercedes on behalf of, it's not even his nation if you think about it. He's from, from Judah in the south. This is Israel, oh, brothers and so on, but it's not exactly his nation. But he's so concerned about the people of Israel, and he might have relatives up there, of course, as well, uh, that he intercedes. Successfully, God says, okay, I heard your prayer. Amos got it, right? And some people don't think God can change his mind. They, oh, well, 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 it says somewhere, you know, I, I'm the Lord, I change not. Actually, Malachi, Jesus Christ the same yesterday, today, and forever. God cannot change. What's this all about? Well, because God cannot change his character or his nature, right? God's character and nature, his integrity, his patience, his mercy, his righteousness, none of God's nature can ever change. But God can change his, his, uh, his decisions about what to do in certain circumstances. Many of God's prophecies are conditional. When God said to Jonah, go and tell Nineveh, time's up. Nineveh repented and, well, says God, I'm backing off now because you know, they, they, they changed. And when they, if people change, if a nation changes, then you know, God will change, simple as that. Uh, so intercession, you know, can be effective. Uh, repentance is effective as well. Uh, and so God will change his specific purposes dependent on circumstances, but not his nature. So don't confuse the fact God never changes his righteousness, his truthfulness, his mercy, his compassion, his faithfulness, never, ever change. His specific decisions about what to do in a scenario is a bit dependent. If you repent, right, turn a corner, or hear if somebody intercedes, God might say, oh, okay, in that case, I will change my specific purpose here because somebody's interceded, like Amos. Well, that's pretty good. So that saves the locust plague from striking Israel. <laughs> of course, they may not have known that as it happens. And intercession, you know, is, is important, but... There's a window of opportunity to intercede with God for a particular scenario because if a nation or person is so wicked, right, and has perhaps ignored and ignored and ignored and ignored God's attempts to warn them and call them to account, if, if you get past that point, there's a line there which we wouldn't necessarily see, but when you go past that line, if you go across that red line, let's say, then God says, that's it. Too late. 
right? I'm not going to listen. Or in some cases, it's more evident, God says to his prophet, don't intercede. I do not want you to pray or intercede because if you do, I'll be tempted to listen to you because of my compassion, my mercy, but I don't want to be there. So don't intercede. And we can see that. If you hold your place there, turn to Jeremiah at chapter 7. So Isaiah and then Jeremiah chapter 7. <clears throat> Read a few verses uh, here. Let's get to Jeremiah rather than Isaiah. Jeremiah chapter 7. Start with verses 1 through 4. And this is about 150 years after Amos was prophesying to Israel. Jeremiah is now prophesying to, to Jerusalem just a very few years before the Babylonians arrived. So their time in Jerusalem was just about up. Verses 1 through 4. The word that came to Jeremiah from the Lord saying, Stand in the gate of the Lord's house, that's the temple, and proclaim there this word and say, Hear the word of the Lord, all you of Judah, who enter in at these gates to worship the Lord. They're turning up ostensibly at the temple to worship God, but the hearts were, of course, not in it. Thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, Amend your ways and your doings, and I will cause you to dwell in this place. Do not trust in these lying words, saying, The temple of the Lord, the temple of the Lord, the temple of the Lord are these. So they were a bit sort of superstitious. They didn't live God's way. They weren't honest and faithful. But they thought, well, God's temple's here. This is Jerusalem, the place where God has placed his name. There's the temple built by Solomon according to God's design and specification. Nothing can happen to us here because, look, there's the temple. And we know God would never destroy his own, his own house, Right? Because well, that's not, not at all true, as God points out in verse 12. Uh, so I'm cutting rather quickly through the story. Go now to my place, says God, which was in Shiloh, where I set my name at the first, and see what I did to it because of the wickedness of my people Israel. So in earlier days in Israel's history, Shiloh was the place that the nation came to to keep the feast days and the sacrifices and worship God. And now Shiloh is destroyed. It's all just ruins. God says, I don't count on my temple because it's my place where my name is because go and look at Shiloh. There's a precedent for my intervening and destroying any place that I previously called my own. Look at verses uh, 15 and 16. There's 15. He continues, I will cast you out of my sight, Judah, as I have cast out all your brethren, the whole posterity of Ephraim. They had precedent. They had an example. God had cast out Ephraim or Israel, Jacob, Isaac, whatever you call them, right? God says, I cast them out because they didn't obey me and humble themselves and walk with me. And of course, you know, get with the plan. That's what's coming your direction. And then the part I'm going to get to, verse 16, God says to Jeremiah, Therefore, Jeremiah, do not pray for this people, nor lift up a cry or prayer for them, nor make intercession to me, for I will not hear you. It's a bit scary in a sense, but what God's saying is, time's up. I've sent numerous prophets over the past century to Jerusalem and Judah. They endlessly ignore me, endlessly ignore me. I can't get through to them. I'm going to judge them. And by the way, Jeremiah, don't you try and change my mind. <laughs> of course, you know, God's mind can be changed. If you remember when uh, God was going down to Sodom and Gomorrah to check out mm, the stories coming out of there, and he was speaking to Abraham, and Abraham said, oh, hang on a second, would you, would you destroy that city? Even if there's righteous people, what if there's 50, 40, 30, 20, 10? God says, okay, okay, okay. If there's 10 righteous people there, I will not destroy the city. Of course, what Abraham was interested in was his nephew, Lot, who was there, right? But Abraham interceded with Jehovah God, who said, okay, I understand. You want me to leave the city alone if there's 10 righteous? Of course, there wasn't, but probably 
partly because of that, you know, the angels grabbed Lot and his wife and his two daughters and dragged them out of the city and pushed them out to safety and then God destroyed Sodom. So Abraham interceded there. You can think of the examples perhaps of Moses with the um, difficult <laughs> people behind him as he led them through the wilderness, right, towards the promised land. Quite often, Moses had to intercede with God. God would say, look, these people are so wicked, I can't take any more of it. I'm going to destroy them all, Moses, and I'll start a new nation with you. And, it, and Moses said, oh, hang on a second. Oh, let's think about that, shall we, uh, almighty God? <laughs> Uh, and so he interceded on several occasions, including once for his brother Aaron, after he built that golden calf, right? And at that point, uh, you know, Moses interceded and God, God listened. God will listen. But there comes a point when God says, I don't want to hear anymore. Like there, don't pray for these people. They're your people, Jeremiah, I understand that. Don't pray for them. Don't intercede. I've got to do what I've got to do and I don't want you getting in the way, Right? So that's uh, quite an interesting approach. Back to Amos now, in chapter 7. So that was our first of our five visions, the, the locust one which God relented on because of Amos's effective uh, intercession. The next I want is verses of 4 through 6. Thus the Lord God showed me, behold, the Lord God called for conflict by fire and it consumed the great deep and devoured the territory or the land. And then I said, oh, Lord God, cease, I pray. <laughs> oh, that Jacob may stand for he is small. So the Lord relented. Concerning this, this also shall not be, said the Lord God. So this vision is of fire, possibly literal fire like, uh, you know, sort of uh, drought conditions, scorching heat, uh, withering of all the plants and lack of water, even the deep, so to speak, being dried up. Some think fire is just a, a picture of invading armies. You might choose whichever one you think is more appropriate. But whatever it was, the vision is certainly a vision of fire. Uh, and intercession happens again and God says, OK, Amos, my man, I won't do it, which is pretty good. And of course, you have to think, if Amos hadn't interceded, right, then God probably would have sent the locusts and the fire. So intercession is, is important. But, you know, there's a time when God says, I don't want to hear. Don't bug me. I've got to do what's right here. I'm a righteous judge. I must do what is right and righteous. So don't get in my way which might have something to do with the next vision, which is a little bit less than clear, I've got to say. Verses 7 through 9. <clears throat> do we have a... No. no <clears throat> Thus he showed me, behold, the Lord stood on a wall made with a plumb line, with a plumb line in his hand. And the Lord said to me, Amos, what do you see? And I said, well, a plumb line. The Lord said, behold... I am setting a plumb line in the midst of my people Israel. I'll not pass by them or overlook them or forgive them any more. It's quite serious. The high places of Isaac shall be desolate. The sanctuaries of Israel shall be laid waste. I will rise with the sword against the house of Jeroboam or the dynasty of Jeroboam. So the standard explanation of this passage here, the most popular one, uh, you find it in most commentaries and so on, which might be the right one. There's a couple of problems with the translation. But the story here is that uh, God has built a wall with a plumb line. Therefore, the wall is bound to be straight, upright, perpendicular to the, the land because there's a plumb line, heavy weight on a line that hangs vertically. And so the wall is built uh, vertically. It's upright. It's true. And then God says here, I'm going to hang that plumb line over the people of Israel and see what it looks like. <laughs> you know what it's going to look like, right? Are they going to be true and upright or are they going to be deviating from what's true? Well, of course, the answer is they're going to be deviating because they're no longer following God or his ways or God's laws, right? So when God does that, he's going to find that, well, the people are deviating from what's true. They are perverse. They are corrupt. I can see it by holding up my plumb line. Therefore, I'm now entitled to go and destroy them. 
like verse 9 says, the high places, the sanctuaries will be destroyed and the dynasty of Jeroboam the king will come to an end. So God's going to test them with his vertical plumb line, right? And Israel, of course, as we all know, will fail any such test. Let's look at one other place and then we'll come back with a further alternative view, which has recently come to light. But to return to Isaiah 28... So Isaiah 28, which is written at roughly the same time as, as Amos. Many of the same thoughts, ideas, issues are being dealt with. But in Isaiah 28, we're going to read verses 16 and 17, the first half. Just the first half, right? Isaiah 28, verse 16. Therefore, thus says the Lord God, Behold, I lay in Zion, Jerusalem this time, a stone for a foundation, a tried stone, a precious cornerstone, a sure foundation. <coughs> Whoever believes will not act hastily. Also, I will make justice the measuring line and righteousness the plummet or plumb line. So what God says there is he's going to use justice, truth, justice, integrity as a measurement of the land or of Zion in this particular case. I will use righteousness right living, right believing, right behavior, right doing, as another plummet or plumb line and compare the nation to justice and righteousness. Now, of course, they'll fail in turn, right? So let's go back to, um, to, to Amos. So that, that seems to be the, sort of, if you like, the standard explanation of that, that vision. It's a plumb line. When God puts his plumb line over the nation, it will utterly fail. And we know that. <clears throat> However... Although that's the, the majority view, there is, uh, well, there are, I think, by the sound of it, a, a number of alternative views. <laughs> One is that uh, the reference to plumb line in verses 7, yeah, in verse 7, um, 7 and 8, the word plumb line, or the words plumb line may not be an accurate translation. It seems nobody's too sure because it's the word in Hebrew is anak, A-N-A-K, Right, which 99% of translators go with plumb line. But nobody's too sure because the words only appear here. They're nowhere else to be found. And some linguists think that the better translation would be tin, you know, as in the metal, you know, tin, tin can and so on. So it might be tin. That is a relevant, plausible, better translation. Not plumb line, but tin. In which case, God built a wall of tin. And said, Amos, what do you see? Amos says, tin, my lord. And you think, what's that supposed to mean? What's tin mean in visionary terms? And, and the, the possibility being outlined by some people is that it's not tin as a metal per se. It's a play on words, which we've seen several times in Amos. We've got another one coming up later. So it could well be that tin isn't the metal tin, but it's to make you think of a similar sounding word in the Hebrew to tin, tin's opposite English, but in Anak, the Hebrew. So what, what could that be? If the word tin is spoken to a Hebrew person or, or Anak to a Hebrew person and they hear another similar sounding word, what would that trigger in their minds? And that the idea appears to be, at uh, the end of verse 8, Behold, I'm setting tin, meaning you, Amos, in the midst of my people, Israel, I'm not going to forgive them, overlook their problems anymore. So it's like really a warning in a sense to Amos, do what you're being commissioned to do. So here's Amos sincerely interceding for, you know, Israel, intercedes over the locusts, intercedes over the fires, and God's just thinking, hang on a moment, I put you in Israel to do a job which is to warn them of coming destruction and judgment. I don't want this intercession business. I've responded twice. So, latter end of verse 8, Behold, I'm setting tin, or the similar sounding word, I'm setting you, I've set you, Amos, in the midst of my people Israel, but obviously to do a job. Get on with it. <laughs> warn them. You know, deliver your prophetic message. That's what you're there for. Because then, verse 9, I'm going to destroy the land and its high places and its sanctuaries. So that's an alternative. I think there might be another one or two. 
But that's the two, well, the main one's the plumb line. And then possibly God is having a little bit of a correction of Amos here. <laughs> Get with the purpose. Amos, you know, your job's not to stop me carrying out my judgment. Your job is to warn these people, which then brings us into the next few verses. Uh, Amos chapter 7. I'm going to read verses uh, 10 and 11 to start with. Then Amaziah, the priest of Bethel, sent to King Jeroboam, saying, Amos has conspired against you in the midst of the house of Israel. The land is not able to bear all his words. For thus Amos has said, Jeroboam, that's you, O king, shall die by the sword. Israel shall surely be led away captive from their own land. And that's, of course, broadly, that is what Amos has been saying. right? But Amaziah doesn't like it. Amaziah, the priest of Bethel. So he shops Amos to the king, probably hoping the king will send a squad of troops, <laughs> cart Amos off and do him in, you know, bury him out in the desert somewhere, right? Uh, but notice in verse 10, Amaziah, the priest of Bethel. So let me just repeat what we covered last week. Bethel is not accepted by God as a place of worship and sacrifice. You can only worship God, uh, in a public sense, at Jerusalem, the place where God has placed his name. All sacrifices must be brought to Jerusalem, to the altar in Jerusalem, in front of the Ark of the Covenant in Jerusalem, where the priests of God and the Levites will service God and his, his temple needs. Bethel is not accepted. Bethel had an interesting history, right, where Jacob had this dream of a staircase going up to heaven and, and built an altar there at one point. But Amaziah is not God's priest. Amaziah is not God's priest. The temple at Bethel was not God's temple. The feasts they kept there were unacceptable to God. The sacrifices they gave there were not acceptable to God. So Amaziah is a sort of idolatrous, possibly even pagan priest. Remember we saw last week, God says, I hate your feasts, I hate your sacrifices. And I said last week, you know, some people jump on that and say, oh, look, God's giving the game away. He hates his biblical feasts. No, he doesn't. Those feasts were the feasts of idolatrous people. Jeroboam even moved the feast of the seventh month of the year to the eighth month. He put his own priests, you know, corrupt individuals in. There's a golden calf at Bethel that they worship. It's not a place where God is worshipped, right? So anyway, he shops Amos to the king. But moving on, verse 12. Then Amaziah said to Amos, Go, clear off, you seer. Flee to the land of Judah. There eat bread and there prophesy. But never again prophesy here at Bethel. This is where the king's sanctuary is and the royal residence, or some translations say temple, right? And I think there was a temple there. That's what archaeologists suggest, a proper temple with, you know, altar place, a place of the animals to be kept, you know, the lambs, the sheep, the oxen, bulls, and so on, uh, places for the priests and, and, the Le and the pretend Levites to stay, for guests to arrive and stay and so on. Go away. That's what he says. Don't want to hear from you. Shut up. Which, if you think about it, is very similar to Amos 2, verses 11 and 12. Just want to turn back there for a second. Amos 2, verses 11 and 12, part of the first eight prophecies of Amos. I raised up some of your sons as prophets, said God, the purpose of giving the people information, instruction, you know, warning, and so on. And some of your young men as Nazarites, isn't that right? O you children of Israel, says the Lord. But you gave the Nazarites wine to drink, therefore breaking their vows. And you commanded the prophets saying, do not prophesy. So that happened a number of times. And here Amos is getting it in the face from the priest Amaziah. So back to chapter, um, whatever that was, seven. So he says, clear off. Back to Judah, troublemaker. Verse 14, then Amos answered and said to Amaziah, I was no prophet, nor was I a son of a prophet, but I was a sheep breeder and a tender of sycamore fruit. You know, back in Tekoa, where he came from. Sheep breeder, possibly a wealthy individual. Some people say the Hebrew of the book of Amos is very good quality, educated type of, uh, of, of, of literature. So Amos might have been a fairly wealthy sheep breeder, an educated man. 
But anyway, God says here, verse 15, Then the Lord took me as I followed the flock, and the Lord said to me, Go, prophesy to my people Israel. So Amaziah says, Don't prophesy. Amos says, Jehovah God told me to prophesy. Who do you think you are? Now therefore hear the word of the Lord. You say, Do not prophesy against Israel. Do not spout against the house of Isaac. Therefore thus says the Lord, Your wife, Amaziah, shall be a harlot in the city. Your sons and daughters shall fall by the sword in the coming invasion. Your land shall be divided by survey line allocated to the invading armies. You shall die in a defiled land. And then summarizing the end of sermon number three, Israel shall surely be led away captive from his own land. So Amaziah doesn't have much of a future. (laughs) It says there, verse 17, your wife shall be a harlot in the city. Uh, Some of the scholars think possibly she already was because uh, it looks like there was temple prostitution at this temple here in Bethel, you know, part of the worship of whatever gods they worshipped there. They had the golden calf and probably other gods as well. And we read in an earlier chapter about how a man and his son went into the same woman, right? That appears to be the temple prostitution that probably was taking place there. And so the feeling is if Amaziah was the sort of chief priest of the temple there, wouldn't be too surprising if his wife was also playing a harlot as part of the overall, you know, temple prostitution, temple services. Maybe, maybe not. Doesn't matter. In the future, at least, they're all going to die or be captives in a foreign land. And like at the tail end of the verse says, Israel shall surely be led away captive from his own land. Right. So Amaziah is trying to silence um, God's prophet. Thankfully, God's prophet. Isn't interesting, especially as he's been told with the, with the tin prophecy, the plumb line slash tin prophecy. I put you in there for a reason. Amos, get on with it. Stop faffing about and stop inter, intervening in my prophesied judgments, possibly. Moving on to uh, the next vision is chapter 8. We won't get too far now, I think. We've only got six minutes <clears throat> to be fast. <clears throat> Chapter 8, verses, uh, where are we? Verses 1 and 2. Thus the Lord God showed me. So he sees another vision. This would be the fourth, won't it? So we've got the locusts, we've got the fire, and we've got the plumb line and or the tin, depending on which of those is the (laughs) more accurate. End of the day, it doesn't matter too much because the overall picture of Amos says he's sent by God (laughs) from looking after his sheep up to... Bethel in the southern part of Israel, which is a sort of a holy site to the Israel people of Israel, just like today to many Catholics. You know, Lourdes in France is a holy place, or Fatima in Portugal is a holy place. Um, Medjugorje is a more recent one. I think that's Serbia or Croatia. So there are places that catch people's attention. They make pilgrimages there, and Bethel was such a place, right? So he sent there with this message to Israel. Clearly, they didn't really believe him. He has his three sermons to try and make his point more clearly. At the end of that, <laughs> it's his five visions. We find out that Amaziah, the priest of Bethel, I guess a leading figure in Bethel, says, Clear off. Don't hear any more of your, your nonsense, right? I've warned the king about you. He'll be after you soon. Clear off if you want to live. <laughs> right. So clearly the people of Israel, the priesthood at least, and no doubt the king, not paying any attention. So what more can God do? We've looked at lots of minor prophets uh, recently, and you can see every one of them, God sends out a warning and a, and, a, and a call for repentance. You know, please repent. Please seek the Lord and live. Please return to me and live. But I mean, what more can God do? And like I said uh, earlier, there probably is a, a red line or something somewhere that God can see and you and I may not see it, but at some point a nation or a person, a you and a me, would pass that, that line and then we're in a serious trouble. Anyway, moving on to vision number four. Thus the Lord God showed me, behold, a basket of summer fruit. And he said, Amos, what do you see? And I said, well, a basket of summer fruit. 
And the Lord said to me, The end has come upon my people Israel. I will not pass by them anymore. I will no longer overlook their sins. I will no longer spare them, other translations bring out. A bit like we read earlier at the end of the plumb line slash tin. God says, I'm gonna, not going to pass by them any longer. I've made my mind up. This is going to happen. I've sworn by myself, my holiness, this is going to happen. So this is a basket of summer fruit. And, uh, of course, a basket of summer fruit, you pick it at a time when it's ripe, right? And so what it's implying here is the time is ripe for Israel to be punished. You don't pick summer fruit prematurely. It's not going to be very tasty, is it? It's all sort of terrible and bitter. But there's a right time when you pick summer fruit. And the summer fruit has been picked. It's in a basket. It was picked when it was appropriate, suitable. It was ripe for picking. It's ripe for harvesting. And the end has come, it says in verse 2, upon my people Israel, the end has come. Right? It's imminent. So this particular vision is really, I guess, emphasizing to Amos and to the people, the end, the destruction is imminent. Now, it turns out to be about 30 years away, so maybe that's perceived to be imminent in God's thinking, but it's very, very, very close. There's little time left. It's imminent. The end has come. Now, there's another play in words here. It's uh, easier to, to follow play in words than the tin <laughs> thing earlier is that's a bit more obscure that one but this one's a bit easier because the the, the two words summer fruit uh, come from a single Hebrew word uh, which uh, you pronounce as kayits which you would spell in English letters as q-a-y-i-t-s kayits that's two word English words summer fruit kayits the word end the end has come the word end is from a Hebrew word kets q-e-t-s so you get kayits Kets, very yeah, quite similar. They're probably more similar in proper Hebrew speakers' pronunciation than mine, right? But kayets and kets, very similar. So when you see the basket of summer fruit, it's just to be taken as it means the end. The end is upon us, right? The people are ripe for harvesting. Um, and like it says there, I will not pass by them anymore. I'll not. I will no longer overlook their transgressions. That, that time has passed. Verse 3, and the songs of the temple, the idolatrous apostate temple, when you're reading uh, like Amos, don't confuse priests, feasts, temples with Jerusalem, right? Jerusalem's where God's name was, it's where the Ark of the Covenant was, it's where the chief priests were, it's where the Levites were, that's fine. You go there, worship God. Bethel, none of that. Everything you do at Bethel, if you're worshipping, sacrificing is an abomination to God, right? And of course they were singing there as well. They might have choirs. If not, they'd gather as, as people. They might have strong drink, <laughs> right? At the feast times, they might sing, might dance, right? But verse 3, The songs of the temple, the idolatrous temple at Bethel, shall be wailing in that day, says the Lord God. Many dead bodies everywhere. They shall be thrown out in silence. So this vision of the summer fruit is a vision of Israel being ripe and ready for harvest and destruction. It's imminent. That's the key meaning of the basket of summer fruit. Okay, and then we move on to uh, the, the latter part of the chapter, which we'll have to cover next week now. But the latter part of the chapter is basically... On the people's behalf, Amos asks God, why are you doing this? People still can't understand the thing, right? They are really quite blind. So Amos sort of puts in a number of implied questions. Why are you doing this to us, God? Well, what are you doing that for, God? And then God gives him the answers. This is why I'm doing it. And he, he gives a number of examples. One, two, three, four or five, I think. Examples of why God is doing it. Which they should have picked up on, you know, long since. So... That'll be next week now as we'll look at the, um, the completion of the fourth vision of the summer fruit. Next week we should get to vision number five, the uh, stricken doorposts. You know, verse, chapter 9, verse 1, strike the doorposts. That's it, the vision of the stricken doorposts. And then, of course, we'll 
of the last five promises. So next week, hopefully, God willing, well, next week, definitely, we'll finish uh, the book of Amos one way or another because the Sabbath after that, as I said earlier, is the Day of Trumpets. Other plans Are for that day. Are you practicing your trumpet playing, Roger? No. That's us. Okay, so we'll conclude uh, there for today.